exchange it someday for a crown in the old rugged cross stained with blood so divine a wondrous beauty I see the earth is Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I cherish the old rugged cross. Still my trophies at last I lay down. will cleave to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown and exchange it someday for a crown Rise 
up from the grave Christ is risen from the dead We are one with Him again Come away, come away Come and rise up from the grave Please uh, join me in a moment of prayer. Father, we thank you that you have allowed us to be here today, Lord God, even in the dark, even with the, the problems that <laughs> we run into here in the building. God, you are with us. You have brought us here. You are present. So God, I ask that you would help us right now to lay our burdens, our distractions, the things that fill up our mind and our heart, Lord, we lay them at your feet. Lord, that you would help us to be present. Present with you, 
what you are doing, what you are speaking to us about, where you have us. Present with you, Lord God, so that we might know your, your power, your goodness, your graciousness, your gloriousness, your goodness over our lives. You might comfort us in the midst of our trouble, and difficulty, that you might encourage us, that you might exhort us, that you might empower us by your spirit to live for you in the midst of the life that you have given us, the road that you have us on. Lord God, we lift up uh, all the concerns, all the things that we have going on around us in the world around us, in our immediate lives. Lord God, we lift up our leaders, leaders of this country as we approach a very tumultuous season. Lord God, that you would give people grace and mercy. God, to not only just to be civil, um, but to see truth for what it is. Lord Jesus, that you would cut through the lies on all sides. And Lord God, in all of that, that your people would be a wonderful witness to your goodness, no matter where our country is, no matter where the world is. A witness to you, who you are, what you have done for us, what you are doing in and through us all because of Jesus. Lord, we've got, I know, a lot of struggle and sin and family troubles and illness and fears and, and, and worries about the future or what it may hold, Lord, because life is chaotic. And so, Lord God, I ask that you would help us right now to just be with you. Help us and answer our prayers. Heal those who need healing, Lord God. Encourage those who are, who, are, who are downtrodden, who are sorrowful. And give us hope through your word for your promises. Jesus, be with us now as, as we also prepare to, to give that which you have given to us, our tithes and our offerings, Lord God, that we would give so cheerfully that the that that which we give would be stewarded well for the sake of your kingdom here in the Leavenworth area. And Lord, prepare us as we continue to worship, as we worship in, in, in the shaking of a hand, in the giving of a smile, in the hearing of your word, in the singing of a song, and in praying both in words and in groaning and in utterances. Please be with us. Help us, Lord, to worship you rightly in all that we do. For your glory and our good, do we pray. Amen. The ushers may now come forward. Oh, sorry, I messed that up. There is a designated, that's, that's what happens when we don't have the announcements ahead of time. You'll notice that there is a designated offering folder in your um, little bulletin thing that we have printed out for you today. That is for Gideon. So if you're wanting to give of that, please put the money for Gideon's in the folder so that it's distinct from the general offering that we provide. So thank you. forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well the spirit is within me because you died and rose again Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true, it's my joy to honor you in all I do. Jesus, you are my 
Good morning, everyone. I would say it's nice to see you, but I assume that's true, uh, based on experience. Hey, uh, so in just a couple minutes, we're going to release the kids. Just a note, though, before we do that, if you're a fourth or a fifth grader, you're going outside. So if you've got a coat or a sweatshirt, take that with you when you go. Uh, don't go yet. We're going to get everybody moving in the dark at one time, so bear with me for just a minute. Uh, just a couple, I, a reminder of the Lenten lunches every Wednesday at noon uh, in room 153. Uh, please come and be a part of that. If you've not been, please come and, and try it out. It, it's an, a great event. And then just another reminder of our Leavenworth week at Spring Canyon. That's going to be the 8th through the 14th of June. Uh, I really encourage you to, to pray about coming to that. If you've got questions, we'll have an open house at our house on the 25th. And those details are in, your, um, are in your bulletin. Now, as the children get up and go to meet Mr. Carl in the back and, and Mr. Keith uh, for Children's Church, please stand up and greet your neighbor. In about 10 seconds, if you could start moving back to your seats, please. Today's scripture is going to be from chapter 12 of Hebrews, verse 1 and 2. And I'll be reading the ESV. Uh, I think it's on page 1180. Uh, not that that's going to help you today in the Pew Bible, but uh, I believe that's what I saw. <clears throat> Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and every sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Michael. Well, I would say, I would say good to see you. Like, Jim, I can't see anybody, and I see his lights now. So... But I'll, I'll pretend I'm looking in the eye, if that, if that helps you stay engaged. It's good to be back with you this week. Um, 
Obviously, we've been in the series, we're continuing the series on what we're calling the disciplines of grace, spiritual disciplines that help us draw near to Jesus in all of life. And what today I want to do is take a a brief pause, right? The last two weeks, we've kind of talked a little bit more about some more specific disciplines with reference to Scripture, meditation, and and and, and longing and pursuing God in in the desert places of life. But I want to take a step back and kind of go back to the theme that we started when we were in Titus several weeks ago with regards to this picture of discipline, the context of discipline, the picture that the Bible gives us for the purpose of spiritual discipline. Why, right, do, do we engage in this? Uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, Chapman Buchanan and I were chit-chatting afterward, and he, he had talked about, he had heard uh, a, a good quote from um, Venus Williams, uh, Serena's sister, the twin sisters who are, who, who are pro tennis players. Actually, are they twins, or did I just make that up? I don't know. Anyway, I don't know enough about them. The quote was what mattered more, but she basically said that, that discipline is, is freedom, in this interview she had uh, this last year. And, and for her, and I read, I read the rest of the interview and whatnot, and she was talking both athletically and also kind of probably, it was a dis- like, I think it was a women's conference, it was also in terms of like self-actualization and, and whatnot. But I think what, so when you think about these, the, the generic, the basic general revelation truth there is discipline does provide us freedom to live in accordance to the way we're designed to live, right? When we don't have discipline, we fall to When we don't have discipline, we are prone to default into bad habits, etc., etc. But when you think about it, and I was thinking of Venus is talking about this as, as a professional athlete, and when you think about it in terms of athletics, when you think about terms of, of training and competing for something, discipline is what gives the athlete the, endur- the endurance to win, right? Without it, the rest of it's in question. In fact, uh, you know, obviously it's Super Bowl week, or Super Bowl Sunday, I mean. It's Valentine's week, guys. That, that, that is probably just isn't more important for, for many in here, right? But um, Super Bowl Sunday today, that's why most, many people are wearing red, not because of Valentine's. And, and as I've been listening to things, you know, and I go to the gym, you see ESPN playing and whatnot, it's funny how many times the idea of discipline has come up. Right, the, the importance of championship winning teams have discipline and, and, and it, the discipline it takes to, to make it to this, to this place. And I found this, this quote online. I was, I, was, I was skimming through things on that. And, and this guy, which again, I didn't, I didn't know who this was, so this isn't like trivia here. Alex Holden, who's a, a former um, first round NFL draft pick for the Saints back in the 90s. He was being interviewed about this coming Super Bowl. And he said this, it was an interesting quote, and this is why I picked it, you'll understand why. He says, it, is in, it will be incumbent on the Niners' defense, because uh, Alex Mould himself is the defensive back, so he's talking about it from the perspective of defense. And he says, it will be incumbent on the Niners' defense, I'm going to pause there. I'm sorry, if, if some of you don't track the whole Super Bowl, this probably won't mean anything to you, right? But it, it, this is, 49ers are playing the Chiefs, go Chiefs, right? And so that, that's what's happening tonight. Okay, so the Niners, meaning the 49ers. I don't want to make assumptions here. Okay, so here we go. Sorry, back, back to what we're talking about. It will be incumbent on the Niners' defense to play within themselves. Say that again. It will be incumbent on the Niners' defense to play within themselves when dealing with Mahomes. Mahomes is the quarterback for the Chiefs, again, for those of you who are... And not let their emotions get the best of them. Listen to the rest of the quote. It says this, The biggest word is discipline, he said. You cannot give him, meaning Mahomes, you cannot give him extra plays like the Baltimore Ravens did when, a critical, when in a critical moment you give him an extra 15 yards because you can't control your emotions. Or tackle him around the neck. Or do stupid things that can cost your team. You have to be very smart. You have to be disciplined. Friend, we're talking about football, but I think that it's telling in light of what Paul talks about actually in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, which we referenced again a few weeks ago in this context of when the word discipline in light of the Christian walk, the Christian faith, Paul often uses athletic imagery, and he does so again in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 after he is talking about what it means for him to be whoever, in, in morally, biblically speaking, who he needs to be for all around him, being, being for the Gentiles or the Jews, to be laying down his life to serve, 
he, he's unpacking all that, and then he gets to this part. At the end of that, of that explanation, of that description, he says, do you not know? He just suddenly all of a sudden shifts and compares it to athletics, specifically a race, kind of like we're reading about in Hebrews 12. He says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Kind of going back to that quote from Molden, he says this, Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Discipline so that I may not be disqualified. Discipline so that I might be who God has called me to be, so that I might run this race. So for the Christian... Spiritual disciplines, the disciplines of grace that help us draw near to Jesus. And I know, we, we, I know you're getting tired of me probably. We're all, and Anthony probably did it last week too. I didn't get to watch the 11. He probably beat this down. Disciplines are not ultimately for a feel good so that we can get through our day. They're not for us ultimately, although they do transform us. D- disciplines are given. The, the discipline of grace is given that we might endure the race that God has set before us. We must run our race with the endurance of grace. Let me say that again. It's the big idea here. We must run our race with the endurance of grace. So here's a question for all of us. Again, taking it back to the why are, we, why are you pursuing discipline, but are you pursuing spiritual disciplines for that purpose? that you might endure the race. And to help us answer that, we just have two big questions today, basically. Looking at this text in Hebrews, we'll get a little bit more into Hebrews here in a minute, we just need to ask two questions. What is the race? Right? If you don't know what you're training for, then your disciplines are going to be worthless to you. What is the race, and how can we run this race well? What is the race, and how can we run this race well? So, number one, what is the race that we are called to run? So right there at the beginning of uh, chapter 12, right, we have him say, let us run. He says, therefore, we'll come back to that in a minute, but the main idea is let us run this race that is set before us. But what word is the first word there in the text that we have in, tra- in the translation in English? What is it? Come on, say it. There, therefore, right? Therefore, this is, you know, good. If you're going to do some Bible study, it's always important to say, what is therefore, therefore? Does that make sense? All right. So, so this is a reason why no one should ever, you should, you should never teach, you should never be taught. You don't just jump into the minute. You don't just parachute into a text and say, okay, let's, let's apply this to ourselves. Because obviously, when they divided the chapters up like a thousand years ago, because remember, just by the way, the Bible did not come with verse and number, okay? They, they, they we added that after the fact, okay? Verse 1 might as well be the end of chapter 11, okay? So that's what's going on here. And let's just to take it back a little bit further to give you a little bit broader context in, in the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 10, the author is coming to this place where he is, in the last nine chapters, has been unpacking the glory of Christ, the, unpacking how he is the fulfillment of the law, how he is our high priest. And then in chapter 10, it comes to this culminating point where he basically says, listen, because Jesus is the high priest, you don't pay anything anymore. There are no more sacrifices. Are no, all that's done. And because he is our high priest, we can with full confidence approach him. And in light of that, as chapter 10 comes to an end, though if, if we are those who have this kind of confidence because of who our high priest is, because of who, how God has made himself available to us, we can live with faith. That's my, my paraphrase. And then it runs right into chapter 11, verse 1. The very famous verse that most of us know on some level, right? What does it say there in verse, verse 1? Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. If you can put it up on the, it's actually on the slide too. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And then verse 2, for by it, the people of old, and we'll come back to that in a minute, that's your crowd, that's your cloud of witnesses right there. The people of old received their commendation. Now, I'm not going to camp on, on defining faith. We did that uh, uh, back in Jonah a little bit. 
But to help us understand it in this context of, of Hebrews 11 and then in this context of, of chapter 12 verses 1 through 2, which is what we're looking at today, we have to understand that, that faith fundamentally, when you look at the definition here, what does it say? It says that faith is the assurance of things hoped for. So I want to say something that might be somewhat weird to you all. Faith implies discontentment. You're like, wait a minute. I thought, I was, I thought I'm doing spiritual discipline so that I can be content. Just think, if you are hoping for something you've been assured, if you were, but so yeah, we've got the assurance part. We'll come back to that. If you are hoping for it, it means that whatever that is right now ain't what it's supposed to be. Right? If you're hoping for a better marriage, if you're hoping for improvement in your job, if you are hoping to overcome an illness, it means something is not good now. Faith implies a holy discontentment. Now, I'm not talking about you can't be happy with, with what you have. It's not what I'm saying. But, but this, this is obviously getting beyond simply finding contentment in every single thing. Because there may be times where you should not be content. I mean, think about it this way. If Joseph had remained content while he was in prison in Egypt, would he have ever gotten out of there? Maybe not, right? Just for, for, for the sake of argument. That's just one example. Faith, faith implies a holy discontentment. It means that at minimum, our reality, whatever it is, is not what we want it to be. We're pressing forward. And, and, and I, this, is, this is probably the, the other side of the coin of, of that challenge, which is this. Without this discontentment, without this hope that drives us to Jesus, there's no faith. And, and I think that's what's hard for us because this is where biblical Christianity and cultural Christianity often kind of part ways at times. Because I think a lot of us, if we're honest, we're, we're pressing into disciplines, we're wanting to grow in our faith so that we can find contentment in the life that we have right now. But, but according to this, maybe, there could be maybe no more dangerous place to be for the follower of Jesus than to find contentment in this world. Hebrews 11 tells us, that, that, that part of faith is a holy discontentment, a hope that makes us press into God to find the assurance of the hope that we have in the promises of Christ. And here's where it gets tough, as we're about to find out. Some of those promises get realized, some don't on this side. So what is that, what is this race then? What are we talking about here? It's the, it's the race of faith. If you put all this together, the Therefore, before such a great cloud of witnesses, let us run the race, let us with endurance run the race that is set before us. It's inviting us into what we're about to read here in chapter 11, and I didn't want to give Michael all that reading to do, so I would say open your Bibles, but you probably can't see them. So I'll let you, if you don't start texting, you can use your phone if that's helpful, right? That's okay? Okay. Because we've got some Bible reading to do. What does this look like? What does faith, the race of faith, look like? And number one, first of all, faith, the race of faith that we are called to discipline ourselves, to endure, to take up, to, to take our part in, which we'll get to in a little bit. Faith hopes or anticipates a future day, a better day. Look at this in just, I'm going to jump down starting in verse 8 in chapter 11. Has some other things before that, but for the sake of time, it says, by faith. Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was what? Let's look at, what does it say? He was looking forward, anticipating. Looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Keep going. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she, was considered, she considered him, meaning God, faithful who had promised. There from one man and him as good as dead. It's another way of saying Abraham is really old. Right? This isn't like eight, oh, people were, you know, they didn't age the same way back then. I, I got it, sure, why not? But, but here it just said he was old, okay? 
what were born descendants, as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of the sand by the seashore. Now listen to this part. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised. But having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having knowledge that they were strangers and exiles on earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. We're talking about going to heaven and saying, we're talking about the new kingdom, heaven on earth. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. So let's just first question, what race are you running? Do you you consider in the core of your being, do you consider yourself an exile here? A stranger? Or in your heart of hearts, are you, whether you realize or not, are you trying to make this place your real home? Please do not hear me say, I'm not saying it is wrong to be at home here. We were made for this earth, but we were made for a transformed one. But are you running in such a way that your race is to get the life that you want here? And that at the end of the day, that is what you want. Like that is where your discontentment is. Or is your discontentment in the fact that this is not the place I was made for. I was made for something else. We were made for something else. And that is what I'm running towards. Is your life defined by that, or is that just like a little sound bite that you tell yourself to make yourself feel better while you chase everything here? I got to wrestle with that. That, that. that means different things for all of us. It's not the same thing. Right? Faith anticipates a future day. It believes in a future that is coming no matter how hard or how long it takes to realize those promises. This is why, I mean, this this points us back to why disciplines are so important, why scripture memorization is important, why meditating on the Word so that you might see Jesus come out of the page and grip you, because when you see this, you think about Hebrews chapter 11 is basically a summary of the Old Testament. It's, taking, it's saying to the people who are being written to, the Hebrews who are the, in, in this context, in this time, who are suffering horrible persecution. And it's saying, remember where you exist in the story. Now it's your turn. They've run the race. Now it's your turn. This is the race you were given, the race that is set before you. And, and the thing is, when we don't have that, when we don't know the story, when we don't know where we fit in the story, we will not help but default to making the story about us and the religion that we follow will be about us, but even more, more devastating, more imprisoning is the fact that because we will not have girded ourselves, we will not have placed ourselves in the scope of His promises, we can't help but then make the life about something that we have to obtain, which only creates anxiety and pride. We have to be in His Word. We have to know His promises. We have to know where that places us in the story, where we fall in it, so that we know know what we're supposed to be running. So it anticipates a future day, but also faith drives us. It moves us to action. But put it this way, faith doesn't sit on its hands. It doesn't wait for God to to drop stuff in our laps. Jumping down to, to 29, what, what does it say starting in 29? It says, by faith, what? Did the people wait for God to just pick them up and float them over the Red Sea? All right, God. We are pinned down. No. It's funny because I remember in the, when you go back to Exodus, Moses is crying out, and this is my paraphrase, and God's like, well, then cross the sea. You know, I know it seems crazy, but, but that's kind of what, what? Because this is what faith does. I'm going before you, and I'm coming behind you. Go. So by faith, it says what? It says people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. 
By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been circled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to spies. Isn't it awesome that in the faith story, a prostitute is in the middle of it? Shows you where God's heart is. And what more can I say? Keeps going, right? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Faith moves. Faith moves you to do things that might seem ridiculous. Do you notice that the story of Jericho is in here? Out of everything that they could have put, I mean, there's so much stuff in there, and it says, by Jericho, or excuse me, by faith, they conquered Jericho. For, all right, for those not familiar with Jericho, it's like one of the most ridiculous stories in the Bible. B- basically this, you know, Joshua is new in command, Moses is dead, and his first mission is to take a city with a marching band. Now, we just read right on by it. Oh, that's a good story. God is good. You know. No, but think about that. You're summoning. We don't have any weapons, all right? You, can't, well, you can fight. Sorry, I can't use you. Oh, you can play the drums. Okay, come on up here, you know? And, and, so, and, then, and then they go, and they march around the city seven times. They camp, and they wait, and then God lets them take the city. Faith moves us. Because it's anticipating, it moves us. This, is, this, this probably is the hardest one for me because God's really been pushing on this one. Thinking about what we're supposed to do is not the same thing as faith. And I think really hard and get nowhere. I mean, are any of you here, and you maybe come every week, maybe you're part of Sunday school, your neighborhood Bible study, you're learning a lot, Hopefully. But are you obeying what you're learning? Are, are, you, are you moving in it? Or are you sitting on your hands? And, and I don't just mean things like, and I, I'm not leaving out things like witnessing to your neighbor or, 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 or witnessing a certain way at work or whatever. I'm talking about God has is, is maybe confronted you with certain sin issues in your life that he wants you to confess, but you're like, I'm not doing it. I'm not going there. Why not? I don't peel it back. Well, I have some pride. I, okay, peel it back a little bit more because I don't know if God can really help me. We all have faith. It's just a matter of what we have faith in, right? Where is our faith taking us? Because, because if we don't, we don't move, we don't have faith, right? If we're not moving, we just have chapel service. Faith moves us. In anticipation of his promises, faith moves us. And then we see that woven throughout, woven throughout this whole story, faith not only anticipates, not only moves, it endures. Even when everything in our bones says, I don't want to go there. I'm like, well, there's all this great stuff. Yeah, we didn't finish the rest of the passage yet. Some of you probably already started reading ahead. What happens there in verse 35? It ends with another good one. Women received back their dead by resurrection, but some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated. I love this next part of whom the world was not worthy. Wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. And all these, all these, though commended through their faith, what does it say? Did not, did not receive what was promised. Since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made.
perfect. And then it rolls right in. Therefore, before such a great cloud of witnesses, let us run. Indeed. (laughs) This race has been painted. And then we get to this exhortation that says, it's your turn. It's your turn. See, what we have to understand is we, we don't just jump into this thinking, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What, what's my job? What, what, what's my responsibility? We've got to understand that, that our race that we've been called to run is part of a much bigger story, that, that this race that started long before us, and unless Christ returns in our lifetime, is going to continue long after we are gone. It's not our race. It's not our story. Our part, our little part of the race, our, the, the, the heat that we have to run, the, the part of our story that's part of this bigger story is just a blip on the timeline of redemptive history. And yet... The exhortation is, let us, let us, because our part to play will not only be for our generation, but if we look at the impact of Hebrews 11, our part to play is so that when we run our race, our part of the race, it would leave a difference in the generation that follows. It's our turn. Why do you want to be disciplined? It's our turn. What we have to decide is will we discipline ourselves to run our race with endurance? Whatever that may mean. I, uh, let, me, let me illustrate this personally. A, f- a few guys in, um, in our congregation in the first and in the service and in the second service also, uh, we were gone this last weekend, which I think you had heard about, and um, went to this event called Mark Men uh, for Christ, and it was a very, uh, very powerful uh, thing. God had been really preparing me in certain ways, and, 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 and I'm not going to give away the, the nature of the event, but, but what you can read on their website, and whatnot, it, they, the, the focus is, and, and obviously this one's for men, but the, the, this truth for all, all people, men, uh, men and women, which is in light of the sinful world that we live in, we all carry wounds, both wounds that have been inflicted upon us, sin of others, as well as the way we sin in response to being sinned against, right? And, and, and they just kind of summarize those as, as five major wounds from the nature of self-deceit and the lies that we end up telling ourselves in the process to the fear and the anger and, and the, the loss and the shame that we carry. And, and you got to understand, for me, the, the nature of it wasn't so much of a lot of new information. I've been, re- God has been graciously revealing to me some of the areas of my, of my fear and, and the way I lie to myself and the way that I put up a false self and whatnot. But I've been doing a lot of that up here in my head. And God really took that time to press into me in my heart to awaken where I needed him to see what, what he was doing, to see the wounds and the issues that I need to face. And that part of the story he's writing, part of the race that I'm having to run is the question of will I face these things? Or will I keep stuffing them down? Trying to rationalize them away, right? I mean, I've, just to be clear, I've been, I've been following Jesus since I was 17, so almost oh, coming up on 30 years, in the next few years here. And I have, God has been so good. He's given me so much freedom in a lot of areas. But there are still things that I struggle with. And God tapped into that this last weekend. And, and, and a takeaway for me has been this, basically. In the race that I run, there are probably going to be things that I've got to wrestle with. Maybe the rest of my life. That I struggle. That I cry out to for help. That I go to Him again and again and again Things that, just looking at Hebrews, so I may or may not receive full healing on this side, but I will on the next. So, so if my race is that I have to struggle with these things, cry out to God, fight, run, 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 so that my wife and kids 
don't have to face the same things, then will it be worth running? Especially my kids. those that we end up discipling in our lives, if God can see you at work running your race, running your part of the race, enduring so that people around you, your family, friends, those that God places in your life to disciple on some level might see the glory, not of you and your victory, but of the great story of the race that has come before you and will go out after you so that they might find themselves caught up in the same promises, trusting in Jesus to carry them to the end. Again, healing is ours in Jesus. We just don't get to decide when it all happens. What we do is respond to this exhortation. Right? So how, that's the race we got to run. Are you running the race? Are you running your own race? Or are you sitting on the side hoping someone will just come pick you up and take you there one day? Run the race. Now, how, how do we do that well? Well, first, what does it say? What are the actual like, practical exhortations in there? It says, first, lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely. So we are, we're told to run, right? We're told to run, but, we, but as we run, first we're told to throw off anything that slows us down, that hinders us, right? This is the time of Lent. We're coming up on Lent. For those of you who are planning on practicing Lent, you know, where you either give up certain things that, that you don't need or that would help you draw closer to God. It's also a time to look at the nature of our besetting sin so that we might repent and, and draw closer to Him. So it's called us to lay aside. But lay aside what? There's t- actually two words there. It's not just a phrase that's all lumped together. First, every weight. It's interesting. It doesn't just say lay aside every sin. Lay aside every weight. My wife and I were joking about this. Husbands, that's not your wife. That's ball and chain. That's not that kind of weight. All right? We're not talking about people who get in your way. Okay? Lay aside every weight. Get rid of it. Expel it. Why? Anybody who's run knows that any excess weight you have will slowly wear you down. And what's amazing about this, I think, what's interesting about this in the text, because these words are separated, that means there are things in your life, the things in my life, that are not sinful, but are incredibly unhelpful to running the race well. I, I know what some of that is for me. I don't know what all of that is for you. But there could be things that are not biblically wrong. It could be drinking. It could be entertainment of certain kinds, right? It could be um, material possessions. It could be your plans in certain ways that aren't in and of themselves wrong, but are they keeping you from running it well? Does wisdom say to you personally, you need to let go of this thing because it's getting in the way of you running? And some of those weights, if they become idolatrous, can turn into sin, right? We can take good things and make them into ultimate things and then become the besetting sins. So what are the weights in your life? What are the sins that trip you up or entangle you or in some translations it might be distract you from the race? If you're doing anything with Lent this this season, maybe I encourage you to, to reflect in light of this passage. I'm not trying to be, to be mean or, or, or put down anybody's Lent like plans here, okay? But don't give up chocolate just because it's, well, that would be kind of inconvenient, you know? If you're going to fast, fast in such a way that draws you closer to God. But you might, might consider, what is it that actually keeps me? Not just my sin, which you definitely need to identify if God is pushing into you on that. But what in your life is just simply a weight that you need to expel? That you need to put aside so that you can run well? Now, quick comment, this is a let us, not just let you individually, because as we know, those are read Hebrews, there's a big exhortation, there's a constant, this encouragement of being, doing this together, right? So, this is not a time for you, and I'm, I know I'm always using marriage examples because I think that's just where a lot of our sin comes out, honestly, right? This isn't a time for us to run around and identify our spouse's weights, 
Oh, you need to get rid of that. Don't watch that. Don't read that. Don't do that. By the way, everything I say, I say from my own personal experience and mistakes. Right? Because what may be a weight for you may not be a weight for her or for him. We need to run and encourage and help and support. Not try and be the person who dictates for the runners around us what they need to do. Right? And, and this really brings up an important thing that we've been looking at throughout our series, right? Which is the, the whole when, when we do these disciplines or when we attack this thing or this thing or whatever, and, and we do not have the grace of Jesus full front in view we will default to fear and pride to drive us, right? So that for the sake of the metaphor, if I do not, if I'm not looking, which we're going to talk about here in a minute, right, looking to Jesus, if I'm not looking to Him, I can't help but look around. And so what will I do? If I'm on this race and I'm not keeping my eyes on Him, I will think ultimately that it's on me to win this race, that it's on me to finish this race completely, my strength, my will, And what does that do for me? Well, what happens is I start looking around, and if I see people in front of me, I might start to despair and be like, why are they so far ahead? Or I might look back and be like, why are they so far behind? They need to get up with me. Fear and pride will creep into this just as much as anything else. Which is why it's so good the passage does not end with verse 1. But it says what? It says, Let us run this race by what? Looking to Jesus, the founder, or in some terms, the author or the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. We are to run. Anybody knows you can't, you've got to stay focused when you're running, especially if it's a marathon. You've got to stay, and by the way, I've never run a marathon, never want to run a marathon. Y'all people run marathons are crazy, but it, I, you've got it, you, even for a two-mile run in the army, just stay focused, right? Don't look around. Keep going. Why? Because I don't want to be entangled. I don't want to be distracted. I need to stay focused. I need to stay focused, but specifically on who? Not this finish line that I'm, I'm worried about, but the one who's already crossed it. Who's looking at me, saying, I got you. Come on. You're not doing this on your own, by your own power, by your own strength, by your own endurance. No, you're doing it with my endurance because I endured the cross. I despise the shame that you carry alone in your sin, but I have taken it upon myself. I despised it. I will bring you home, the trailblazer, the one who's already run the race. And how does he endure? It says what? For the joy set before him? That's not just the joy of getting off the cross. That's not just the joy of being reunited with his father after having suffered his father's wrath. When you look at John 15 and on, Jesus talks about joy over and over again. And in that context, over and over again, it's about sharing his joy with those who are his. Part of the joy that was set before him was getting you. So now his joy shared with us becomes our joy. To endure. Our reward of getting him who joyfully endured for us. Do you see the exhortation? Please hear this. Please, and please, if there's anything you remember, I know I have a main point up on the slides and whatever. Anyway, please hear this. We do not run this race trying to become like him so that we can behold him. We look to him, we behold him so that we can run. It is easy to get that turned around. Really easy to get that turned, right? In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 18, Paul even talks about this. We all with unveiled face, what? Beholding the glory of God are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. It's not we are trying to transform ourselves from one degree of glory to another so that we can behold Him. It is beholding Jesus, having him full front, right there, in front, all the time. And what's beautiful is even when we trip and fall, he's right there to lift your face. Keeping our eyes on Jesus. That's why I had this song today. 
Because why? When you look full in his wonderful face, the, thre- the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We'll be able to shed the weights. We'll be able to put aside the sins. We won't be focused on others or ourselves. We'll be run the race with endurance without fear or pride, without fear or pride getting in the way. Anybody ever, I haven't seen the full thing, but Chariots of Fire, old movie, right? Two main characters there, Eric Liddell, Christian runner, then Harold Abrams. What's interesting is there's, a, there's some telling quotes in there. At one point, Harold Abrams, who's not a believer, says that when I look down that corridor, when I'm running, it is ten lonely, st- what I have, when I, when I see that, I'm paraphrasing here, I have ten lonely seconds to justify my whole existence. And that's what we have without Jesus. And Eric Liddell, here's a quote in the movie where he says this, God made me fast, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. That was his drive to run. The race was already run in his heart. We must run our race with the endurance of his grace, and we find our endurance in the one who joyfully ran in our place. So I'll just finish with this. Are you running the race that is set before you? And are you being an encouragement to those around you as they run the race with you? Are you laying aside the weights, the hindrances, the sins? And are you looking to Jesus, not to yourself, not to others around you, but looking to Jesus who has won it for you, who will bring you home so that you can run this race well? I was thinking about this. Have you ever wondered what we're going to talk about when we get up to heaven or when the new heavens and new earth? It's funny. It's somewhere in Revelation, and I'm blanking right now. It talks about like the stories of Moses and everybody there that you tell stories. I'm like, if you think about it, like, well, why don't we just be talking about Jesus the whole time? Why are we going to talk about what happens in like Hebrews 11? And I think one reason is this. When we get up there, you know, Noah's going to talk about things like, yeah, he had me build an ark, and there was like not an ocean for hundreds of miles but he did this and so on and so forth and then our stories would be part of that deal where yeah I, I don't know what, what God was thinking right I mean it was just me and, and, and but he he moved in me his promises became realized in my life one step at a time and, and he started moving and he said he did this in and through me and and for the sake of his kingdom so that all of us when we tell our stories about our part of the race can raise a glass and toast the king Let us help each other run the race for the sake of Jesus. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you. Um, You were good. Lord Jesus, it is so easy to be distracted by so many things that we either, we, we either, we know the race is there and we are just getting intimidated and we are wearing ourselves out or we forget that we're even on the track. So, Lord God, I, I pray that for all of us in here, you would work in us in such a way, through, through individually and, and in our marriages and our family and our friends, to, to, to spark this conversation, to, to help us to encourage one another by grace, not by guilt, not by condemnation, but by grace to encourage each other to run our part of this race. That we would live for you, that we would hold on to your promises. For your glory and our good, do we pray. Amen. same old road for miles and miles You've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies You've been trying to fill the same old holes inside There's a better life 
there's a better life. You got pain, it's a pain taker. You feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom, save it. He's a prison shaking savior. You got chains, he's a chain breaker. Somebody testify, testify. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify. You got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. Shaking Savior, you got chain. He's a chain breaker. Oh, you need freedom for saving. He's a prison shaking Savior. You got chain. He's a chain breaker. you guys again for being with us. If you would like to join us in the dark for coffee and, and uh, donuts, there are some available. Just be careful when you're pouring and, and whatnot. It'll be good. And uh, we can enjoy some time with some faceless uh, fellowship. Uh, in all seriousness, though, uh, go and be blessed this week. I pray that we would help each other to, in, to, to really run the race that we've been called to run. Right? Not, not play games, but to know that he is with us. So go this week, run the race well in the name of Jesus, looking to him, encouraging one another, and go enjoy Super Bowl Sunday. So you all do that. Be blessed. We'll see you all next week. Thanks, guys. Christ.